Greer Hendricks obtained her master's in journalism from Columbia University and spent two decades as a book editor before becoming a novelist. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Allure, Publishers Weekly, and other publications. Together with Sarah Penkinen, <laughs> sorry, she has written yeah. the New York Times best-selling novels, The Wife Between Us, An Anonymous Girl, and You Are Not Alone. Andrea Yarura Clark grew up in Argentina amid the political turmoil of the 1970s until her family relocated to North America. After graduating from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service, including a year of study at the Universidad de Salvador in Buenos Aires and completing her MBA at York University, she returned to Buenos Aires to connect with her roots. By the mid 1990s, many sons and daughters of the disappeared, the youngest victims of Argentina's military dictatorship in the 1970s, were coming of age and grappling with the fates of their families. She interviewed several of these children and their experiences, not widely known outside Argentina, and inspired her debut novel, On a Night of a Thousand Stars. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, two sons, and a spirited terrier. I'm now gonna let them take it away. Hi everyone, thank you. I'm Greer. Um, I'm Andrea. Um, and you, uh, you might wonder why the two of us are here together because we have Andrea who's written this fabulous, I'm just, you guys have to, this, you're getting a two for one special here because it's not just my book, but this mm -hmm. is her book on a night of a thousand stars that went on sale just a week ago. And so you might wonder why we're here together, but this, our, our relationship is that um, we, Ha, um, have sons who are the same age. And Andrea, before she um, moved to Brooklyn, lived a few blocks away. And we would always run into each other. We were always late. <laughs> Our kids, we were always late. Our school is just a few blocks away. And we were like the stragglers. <laughs> And we would walk our kids to school and then we would walk our dogs together in the park. And during this time, um, I, was a, I was a book editor and Andrea was working on her debut and we would talk mm -hmm. endlessly about, you know, kind of like wanting to change, you know, for me, change careers and her to launch. You had written your book first as a screenplay, That's right? That's right, yes. Yeah, and so we would talk and, um, we, so we just became really good friends. And then when I published my first book, which, and Andrea's gonna ask me more about that, um, um, she was really one of the first people I told that I wanted to write and you told me. And so that that's, anyway, so we were fr friends first and now- Right, and now, and now authors. Well, you've right. been an author for a long time, Greer, um, well, but I'm just so uh -huh. excited to have my book come out just well, a week before yours. And thank you yeah. so much for inviting me to to this event tonight. I'm so excited to be here. So yeah. let's just jump right in. And for anyone who hasn't read The Golden Couple, I mean, it did just come out yesterday. Yeah. Can you give everyone yeah. a brief summary? Yeah, so it's, you know, I wish we were doing this in person so I could see, like, I don't know how many of you have read um, my, you know, other books, The Wife Between Us, Anonymous Girl, You Are Not Alone. They're all like dark, twisty psychological thrillers. And The Golden Couple, um, is is in that same genre and to give like a short the short version is that avery chambers is um well she was a therapist she lost her license but she still counsels people with this very unusual method it's a 10 session method and she won't take you on unless she thinks she can fix you so you might come to her with you know a troubled marriage or mm -hmm. issue with a boss or a mother and if she thinks she can kind of fix you in those 10 sessions then she'll she'll take you on so that's our one of our main protagonists and then the other protagonist is Marissa and I keep it's funny because I keep being about to call her Marina because for the majority the whole time Sarah and I wrote this book her name was Marina and then at the last minute we changed it and so I still slip up all the time mm -hmm. but anyway her name is um, Marissa Bishop mm -hmm. and she hears um, she learns about Avery's method and she brings her husband to therapy and this is not going to spoil anything to say he thinks that they're going in there to talk about their eight-year-old son Bennett who's been um, bullied at school but boom page three she says we're not here i need to i need to tell you something i um i slept with another man and it's like a bomb went off in that therapist's office um but the couple decides to work with uh avery to try to repair their marriage and then the story the story goes from there and so. this, and it's a excellent book 
I just finished it and I can't wait for all of you to start reading it. You're going to love it. Love it. Um, so what? you mentioned earlier that you were an editor and you were Sarah's editor yeah. um, before you teamed yeah. up to write together. Can yeah. you tell us how that came to be? Yeah. So um, I was an editor at Simon & Schuster and um, a, I don't even know how many years ago, let's say 14, I'll make that up. It sounds about right. I was submitted a debut by this author, Sarah Pekinen, and I, I loved it, but I wasn't alone. There were a lot of other mm -hmm. editors who wanted to acquire Sarah's first book and I persevered and we worked together on seven books because she was like a book year author and she wrote primarily women's fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, we became really close. We discovered we had a number of uncanny similarities. So we both studied psychology and journalism. We are both terrible cooks. Mm -hmm. She always says I shouldn't be revealing that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. We are both the exact same age. We both have brothers we're really close to who are both named Robert. So weird, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's funny that I'm doing this with you because the only other person I confessed my secret about wanting to write to besides, you know, my husband was, um, was Sarah. After I left publishing, we, we had really like been, I'd collaborated with her on a lot of her books. You know, she would come to me and I wouldn't say collaborated. That sounds like I did more on that than I did, but we were very, I was a very involved editor mm -hmm. and I told her the secret that I wanted to write. Um, and see, it could have been you, but she said, <laughs> she said to me, why don't we write a book together? And I thought, gosh, why does she want to write a book with me? She's written seven books and Sarah is very, um, instinctive and intuitive. And she just said, she just had this gut feeling that we could do something really, um, magical. Um, so that's how we, that's how things started, but should I just keep going? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm going to keep going people. Um, so, um, because the story is, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, to me, like such a magical story, but so then the question was, well, what are we going to write? And so we both went to our bookshelves and we pulled down our favorite books from the past few years and they were all strong female protagonists. And when we talk about your book, we'll, we'll get to mm -hmm. that too. Cause that's something you're really interested in too, is exploring. And, um, and they were all psychological in nature. Um, but Sarah had primarily written like quote unquote women's fiction. And I had really, that's probably prob primarily what I had edited. Like I had edited um, Jennifer Weiner and Taylor Jenkins Reid, like women who would be kind of put in that category. But we knew we wanted to write more of like a, more like a thriller or a suspense. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question though was, well, how are we going to do this? Because she lives in DC and she has another, she's doing another event tonight, which is why we're split up. Um, but so she was in DC and I was in New York and um, we were joking earlier um, with the staff at RJ Julia about tech issues. And normally like the kids are always the ones to help, right? Mm -hmm. So my daughter who was then 13, said, hey mom, there's this like newfangled technology called Google Docs and Google Hangouts. And so she set us up on Google Docs and Google Hangouts. And so that's how we um, wrote our, our first, uh, we wrote really wrote our first three books that way. And then sometimes we would go to each other's cities like every other month to do some plotting mm -hmm. and bring these like giant notepads and post-its and do our big plotting that way. So, yeah. Um, so you talk about, so you would get together, right? While yeah. you were writing these novels. But so yeah. then how did COVID, oh, uh, COVID right. impact your, yeah. Yeah. your working yeah. together? So we were on our book tour for our third book. And Sarah's also very superstitious. So she hates the number three. And it was our third book. And it came out on March 3rd in mm. 20, third, 20. Three, three. Three, three, third book, March 20th. Oh, it's a lot of threes. A lot yeah. of threes. And... You know, we went on our tour and every day we we're like, should we still be touring? Should we still be touring? And finally we had to can't, I mean, we, it wasn't safe for us or for our audience. So we, mm -hmm. we canceled our tour. Luckily we had started our fourth book, um, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and the fourth book, the golden couple, what's also interesting is that, uh, it's each book has kind of started with a different, um, kind of from a different point, but this book started with the title and it was a title that our mm -hmm. editor. Did you know this? Jen yeah. Enderlin, or yeah. Jennifer Enderlin, my brilliant editor at St. Martin's, gave us the title and said, I think you guys could do something great with this. And so yeah. that was, a, so, so we started. Now we had been working remotely, unlike a lot of other, um, you know, a lot of people. So we were familiar with the technology. Um, but 
things change. So the other thing about Sarah is like we used to write every line together. Like a lot of authors, they'll alternate chapters, like or one will take a different character. We didn't do that. We wrote everything together. COVID mm -hmm. changed things a bit because all of a sudden she had a bunch of kids at home. Mm -hmm. I had kids at home. I had my husband around who was like, my husband every day would make like a shake. I was, my little office was like outside the kitchen. He'd make these blender shakes mm -hmm. and, and Sarah's kid would be going like, mom, you know, I need lunch. It kind of put a damper on the creative process when you mm -hmm. hear that. Mm -hmm. So we still talked endlessly about each scene and each chapter, but we did a little bit more, a little more individual writing. Okay, I want to put a pause because I want to. I want. I, oh, okay. Okay, no, I because I. You, okay. Okay, no, and okay. you will. You will in a minute. But okay, I love. Okay. I love how your editor okay. threw a title at yeah. you and and said, "Run with it." It reminds me of what it would be like to take an improv class. You know, <laughs> like, you know yeah. just like two or three cues, and then yeah. and then how what how the team, you know, the the cast puts together this fun scene. Oh. So that's sort of reminded me of that. Oh, I love that idea, yeah. and it's funny because. Um, we it was crazy that no one had ever used that title before like it's such a good title i think yes so it is. and we learned so we did like, a search and there was like yeah there was nothing there mm. and then we came up with the idea for avery very quickly i we knew there had to be like a golden couple so that is um marissa and matthew bishop but we came up with avery so i mean what i i love this book because it combines my favorite topics which are complicated marriages mm -hmm. kind of like the wife between us had a complicated marriage mm -hmm. and therapy with anyone here who read an anonymous girl there was also you know a very a very um I was gonna say mischievous, but not really mischievous, more of a, well, she was a complicated therapist. And so Avery um, is is really a maverick. And so it's just so fun to explore these topics. But that 10 session method was like, that's what we just knew that that was what she was gonna do. Brilliant. I Brilliant. mean, would you, okay, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Someone says to you, would you go see a 10 session therapist? Oh, yes. <laughs> It's like the miracle, you know, pill in yeah. a way, because therapy is, can, I know, can take for years, yeah. right, to fix anything, whatever you have going on in your life. So if somebody came up to yeah. me and said, I can fix whatever yeah. is wrong in your Maybe. marriage, yeah. in 10 sessions, I would totally yeah. sign up. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great premise. Yeah. And she's invasive, though. I think what I didn't really get at in the beginning was like, she, she wants complete access right. to your life. So you really have to be willing to, you know, kind of turn that over to her. So, right, yeah. right. No, but I, I, you know, people watch a lot of reality TV. I don't know. I feel like that you would get a lot of people interested and they would be comfortable oh. having you into their house because, you know, that wait, does happen. This is a hold on, everybody. Okay, I think, your pen out. wait, I think we just came up with a great idea a reality TV show with a therapist. 10 sessions. 10 sessions. It's a 10 episode uh, limited. Right. You know. Well, I mean, of course we want that for our book. Yes. But, but as, but make it a reality mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. People are go, go, love is yes. blind, all these things. Yes. Oh God, I wish I could see everybody. Who thinks this is a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's like, you can raise your hand. Can they? Raise your hand. As nobody's raising their hand. Are we just like, we, ha we haven't even been <laughs> drinking yet. <but. laughs> Uh, okay, but so okay, earlier, okay. you were mentioning how COVID comp made it harder to yeah. maybe get the creative juices flowing yeah, because yeah. there were interruptions. And so I want to ask you yeah. about that. I mean, yeah. did you, how would you handle your creative differences? Yeah, yeah. If there were oh. any, and yeah. well, from one book to the next, have you learned how you know, yeah. to better manage that? Yeah, well, people always want to know if there's like a cat fight or something, mm -hmm. I feel like. But Sarah and I have, we have, we have a million mottos. So we have like better together because we never could have written any of these books alone. Like they're so dark and twisty that we always joke, we've got like one brain, but we need both our brains to keep track of all the twists and turns. And one of our other mottos is if it's not working for one of us, it's not working for both of us. And so there's, you know, in, there's, you know, option A, option B, and then there's C and usually C or D or E or F is bet is better. And we just talk and talk and talk endlessly. Like another one of our sayings is like, what if, we're like, what if, you know, this, and we egg each other on. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a collaboration, but I think we knew pretty early on that our, we knew that our narrative instincts, our editorial instincts were very similar mm -hmm. and we wanted to tell similar stories. So whether you're debating, you know, we don't really, neither of us has an ego about whether it's, you know, brown eyes or blue eyes or, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So um, in, um, in You Are Not Alone, 
Sarah felt like we were kind of cheating at one point in giving mm -hmm. in, in giving something um, uh, kind of playing with some names in a way that she felt was a little like cheaty and the, and our editor actually didn't have an issue with it but it kept nagging at Sarah and so mm -hmm. I was like you know what let's just we'll we'll just figure it out we'll fix it mm -hmm. and like the end of the wife between us we went we redid that ending multiple times to make sure that it satisfied both of us okay um, oh good so yeah you, you, you really did work together oh yeah I mean we well, yes 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 and I mean so, clearly yeah. um you know yeah. these fabulous results uh, yeah. <laughs> all those novels have been yeah. wildly successful Greer yeah. um and some but, well I have all of them been optioned? I know you've had some of these yeah, projects yeah. have been optioned for film, TV. Yeah. Can you give us an update on yeah. all these projects, which is the holy grail for many authors. It's the holy grail, but it's also we're very realistic that so few, like when I was an editor, a lot of my author's books were um, were optioned and nothing happened. And then yeah. some did, like you know Jennifer Weiner's In Her Shoes, which for anyone who hasn't seen that movie, they did a great job with that movie. Um, I did The Perks of Being a Wallflower, mm. but he ended up adapting Steve Chbosky. Oh. But it's hard, it's, it's you know, hard. But our first book um, actually sold on a partial manuscript to our editor. And I think that's because Sarah, you know, had written eight books mm -hmm. or seven at that time. And I was an, I was an editor and we ended the partial was on that big twist, which for anyone who hasn't read it, I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a big twist at the end of part one, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so it sold um, on, on that partial and then an outline, and then it leaked to, um, to film agents. And oh. so it was actually bought for film before we had finished writing the book. Oh, did wow. you not, you didn't no, know I did that. not know yeah. that. That's so it, exciting. It was, it was, it was, it was, so it sold to Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, but then it's a hard book to adapt. And so when Sarah and I were on tour for our, oh boy, I think it was our second book. We literally, and when you go on tour, okay. So for anyone, I mean, in the good old days, when you actually used to go on tour, you'd, you know, pack a suitcase and you never checked your bags because you were, mm -hmm. and if you lost your, you know, yeah. you're going from city to city. Mm -hmm. So so we get a call that one of the heads of Amblin wants to meet with us. And we fly into LaGuardia and we're standing in like bathroom stalls, holding up like our outfits, like, does this stain look too bad? Is this too wrinkled? Like we're going to meet with this woman and we're meeting her at the Ritz. And we didn't really know what she wanted, but we sit down with her and she says, she's like, we've been having trouble finding someone to adapt your, you know, adapt the story. A lot of people have had a take, but it hasn't worked for us. Would you guys be interested? And so we, well, Sarah's always like, you know, like I said before, she goes with her instincts and I'm like the more cautious one. And I was like, we need to think about it. And Sarah's like, are you crazy? Of course we're going to do this. So we did a pitch. We mm -hmm. had to pitch them oh, wow. and we didn't know how to do a pitch. So we, uh, we looked up like, you know, Google our best friend, Google, how to, how to write a pitch. And we pitched it to Amblin and they accepted it. And so we, um, we wrote a screenplay. They were really kind. They told us to tear it apart and do it all over again. And it keeps being, they, they have, I mean, I don't know what will happen, but they keep renegotiating so that it's oh. still in the, it's still there. And then the two other projects were, um, were um, optioned, but the options have lapsed. Anybody out there, if you're mm -hmm. interested mm -hmm. and, um, and then fingers crossed there is probably some good news on this one. So oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Can we just pause? Not though? Surprised. Okay. 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 Uh, now I want to ask you, okay. For every, so okay. for anyone who, uh, you, uh, who, anyone who has not read Andrea's book yet, why don't you give your, you give your synopsis. Okay. Oh, um, okay. So my uh -oh. book has two storylines. Yeah. The first one takes place in the 1970s in Argentina in the years leading up to the 1976 military dictatorship. And it involves two students who are, um, are in university and there's a love story against the backdrop of this political turmoil that's happening in the country. And the second narrative takes place in 1998 specifically and it begins um, in New York um, and we, it's through the eyes of Paloma and she, she'll tell us her story that will take her to Argentina with her parents who are Argentinian and where she's going to seek um, some answers about her family. So I had, I, I read a very early draft of Andrea's book when we were, mm -hmm. when she was, you know, still, you know, you were in your, you know, the beginning stage. Very beginning, yes. And you revised this so many times. Mm -hmm. And in the first, the first draft that I read, it only took place in the 19, 
98. Yeah, it yeah. Yeah, it was just the 1990s. Right. right. And then, so can you explain to people, because I bet you there's at least some people out there who, who, you know, want to write books and to then decide, like, how did you then decide to shift it and make it into two time periods? So, yes, the original manuscript with all the rewrites that I had was really focusing just on Paloma's story in the 1990s with very brief flashbacks to the 1970s. I would say maybe a total of 10 pages. That's crazy. So, um, because, you know, so there was the story that she, you know, this story that she was trying to figure out um, about the yeah. takes place in the 70s, but I really just had these flashbacks. Mm. And through some great um, readers yeah. who gave me their feedback, it just, made sense for me to really do a deep dive into the 70s yeah um that yeah. basically meant tossing out a lot of what i'd written um yeah. in well i'll consider contemporary although it takes place in 1998 it really reads like contemporary yeah fiction. yeah yeah um so yeah i basically yeah. rewrote the uh, the like whole half, novel in a way half the novel is was new yeah but that i'll say because i already had the outline so to speak of how what the arc of the story was going to be yeah it was just, I don't know, just sort of flowed easily, more yeah. easily. And I was yeah. able to, after I did a lot of research, I sat down and wrote and it didn't take me that long, as long as the whole 1990s part did. I think as a writer, a lot of what you don't put on the page, it but it doesn't, it informs every decision that you make. So you may not know that somebody, you know, for lunch would eat seven almonds and you know asparagus or something wacky or whatever that might not ever come out but you know all those details oh. so you knew inside out the history but you had to still have to do a lot of research yeah i mean right yes so. i did and because it's a, it's you know but some of i've already had some um really great um reviews and people talking about yeah. this issue that they did not know so yeah. this is not familiar so anyone who's listening to us tonight watching us who reads it, you, you probably won't be familiar with the story, which is why I also felt compelled to write this. Yeah. It was it was in my head for so many years. I'd been, I'd moved back to Argentina. I spent my childhood there and I moved back after college. And anyway, so it, it was just, I was intrigued by what had happened to the children of all these people that went missing during yeah. the dictatorship. And when mm -hmm. I moved back to New York, the story stayed with me and I thought I need to, I, I just need to write it. Anyway, there's not much, you can't read books in English about it. So I was asking for help for my cousin. Uh -huh. um, for example, she sent me books. So I, you know, I was reading every, a lot of the stuff in Spanish, um, but it was, it was, it wasn't a history that was even being taught in high schools. Wow. So, but I'm grateful to the journalists who did do the, all this work. That's incredible. I mean, I knew nothing, right. but I didn't it's, know. It's I didn't know if I was just. I just no. no. I didn't know if I was just really ignorant because of, you know. But but that's why. I mean, and I will say this: what's I pay it the highest compliment by saying that it was educational. That I learned a lot, but it's a total page turner. Like you've got mm. those short chapters, and you're and also sometimes when you're reading books in two either two time periods or two mm. perspectives, you're like kind of more invested in one than the other. But every time I left like Santiago's story in the seventies, I was like, oh God. Wait, but I don't want to leave. And then, but then I get to Paloma, and I'd be like, "Oh, wait, now I'm with Paloma." Oh. So I just could. I mean, literally, I read it in two days. I, like once I, I just, I mean, the the, the new version. So yes, yes. Uh, I just could. I couldn't put it. I couldn't put it down. So because it, oh, it really you. does have that propulsive quality to it, but yet you feel like you're smart when you're reading because you're learning something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so what okay. I did for me, what was um, more interesting was how these against this backdrop, this political turmoil and eventual violence was housed. Well, how do people go about their daily lives? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was really focusing more on, the, on this. There's a love story and different people coming at life through from different lenses. I don't know. So I was just really looking at the stories and I'm glad the history, I was able to weave it in organically. I don't know, but to me, it's really more of a love story than like, I don't know, but so that's, that's both. Yeah, yeah. But maybe it is both, I don't know. That's it's a father, it's a it's a, it's a a parent-child story. It's a love story. Like it's kind of got some, yeah. something for everyone. And did you know what the end all along was gonna be? As um, people ask me that mm -hmm. a lot. Did you know how it was gonna end? Well, because it is historical fiction, I sort of wanted to mirror a little bit about what did actually happen. Right. 
But in terms of the family and Paloma, no, that sort of, that had some different approaches towards the end. Yeah. How do you okay. were talking about your, um, was it the wife between us? You said we wrote many well, different uh, endings. Well, we had, um, it's funny when we pitched it and sold it to Hollywood, we mm -hmm. had an ending. And then we spoke to a lot of these Hollywood people and they kind of had a little bit of a different take on what the ending should mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote an ending that was actually a lot um, softer than uh, we ended it. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to say, but it was a much softer ending. And then mm -hmm. when we sent it to our editor, she was like, wait, what about the ending that I bought this to oh, have? Oh. And so then we went back. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it shifted back, it shifted back and forth. That's right. Yeah. Cause you sold it to Hollywood parsh a partial, uh, partial manuscript, which yeah. is unbelievable. That's unheard of. <laughs> so I know, but it had that big, so it had the big twist. It had yeah. that, it has a commercial, you know, whatever it was commercial. Right. So okay. yeah, yeah. So that was, um, but yeah, I think that's an interesting question for like a lot of writers. Mm -hmm. And then do you, are you more of like, you know, the question of like, are you a plotter or a pantser? Do you know that expression? No, uh, but no, can you, oh, yeah, okay. No, You're gonna be, yeah, so how does yes, this work? Yes, debut author. This is a question <laughs> you will be asked a lot, which okay, is good like, to know. okay, do you plot, <laughs> like, do you plot your stories out, outline, or are you more like kind of like wing it as you're writing? Can I say I do both? Yes, I think that's probably the most common yes, answer, but yes. yes. Okay. Because I do, I did have to have an outline. Yeah. It helped, I had, I'd done, a, um, I'd had this screenplay from long ago yeah. that I turned to, it served as like a, you know, a very informal, I don't know how you say, like loose outline, but then I moved on from there. Um, with the 1970s, because I'm, ba I'm based, I had historical events sprinkled throughout that. Yeah. So I had to make oh, sure, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. like I have like a, a big protest that I have, uh, kidnapping happened that were based on true true events yeah. so that part was plotted yeah and then um even a concert that they go to so there's a real yeah. things that are happening yeah and and then i would bring in like my characters and see how are they going to react how are they going to evolve mm -hmm. around you know around these events i feel like it's like kind of like you're on a road trip and you knew you were going to stop in certain places you had to stop there but you didn't exactly know the road you were going to take to Perfect. get there to, yes, to get that's there exactly. right? and that's, that's what made that's what made the journey fun yeah oh you, yes yeah. once i once i knew okay this is where i have to go from a to b but how you know how am i going to get there right right yeah, am I going to take the windy road yes. or the straight road? And, and, and honestly, the characters would yeah. tell me how to do it, yeah. where to go and what they were going to do. And did you have, so there's some, you know, very troubling scenes, har harrowing scenes in your book. Um, how do you turn that off at the end of the day? I wouldn't. I mean, I would. first of all, it was really hard to write them. Yeah. So I would sort of skip. Uh -huh. And then I, I you know, I with a nudge maybe from my editor saying no can we you know Andrea you have to we have to see a little more so yeah. um so first of all I was sort of avoiding it and then once I did one of the uh, I came to writing later in life yeah I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be a novelist and I had worked in music for a long time I worked at Tower Records yeah. we had a Tower Records in Argentina uh -huh. I worked and in television like MTV okay. but it was called Much Music um, so I was always in working in music and that to me is like, it just oh. nourishes my soul. It makes me feel better. Uh -huh. It transports me. So yeah. if I, you know, if I needed to feel like kind of get out of that funk that, you know, when you write to hard scenes, yeah. cause you've had them too. Yeah. In your yeah. Music saves me. Interesting. And do you write with music? Yes. Or do you, okay. Not all the time, uh -huh. but I, to get me in the right mood, if I have yeah. to go back in time, I'll listen to like 70s music from Argentina, reminds me of my childhood. And what about you? Because you were finishing your book when you had a full house. How did you juggle that? Because you had, so for many years, you, you know, your kids were off at school and your mm -hmm. husband was off at work and you had, it was just you and Toby, the adorable yes, dog. Yes. So how, how did you, were you able to just close the door and get work done? Or was that, was that hard? Yes, yeah, so I've definitely had to toss my cell phone out. And we were all looking at reading the news, weren't yeah. sure what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so it was a hard time to yeah. focus. Yeah. Um, luckily, at that point, I was already deep in, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I was probably listening to more music then, or even wearing AirPods if there wasn't, if I didn't have a quiet space. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, one of the um, silver linings of everyone being at home was able to hear my kids 
you know, on Zoom for their classes. I don't know, there were nice little breaks that yeah. I got from the writing. I enjoyed that. And yeah. I, I'm a little bit maybe like John, who's like making the shakes or like, yeah, and I, my husband, I, my husband, yeah, yeah, you know, like yeah. It, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm a great cook, but I yeah. also find oh. it therapeutic to okay. cook. Oh. Um, yeah. So I was doing that too yeah, and, and yeah. enjoying it. And that's how I'd also get myself away that's from it. the, from the book. And right. The that, yeah. Interesting. That's so not the way that I would <laughs> ever take a break. <laughs> what would you do as a break? What do you do? I, I mean, I'm a runner, so mm -hmm. I, I exercise, I'm walking and um, I mean, and it, yeah, it sort of, it depends on the, it depends on the season um, where mm -hmm. I am, but um, I find a lot of times when I'm running or walking, I get a lot of breakthroughs in mm -hmm. my, in my thoughts about, you know, characters or plot. And so um, I'll either text myself or I'll text Sarah, I'll mm -hmm. be like texting her things. And she somehow seems to understand, you know, it's like, blue you know flower and she's like yes blue flower we know i know exactly what that means so um just things come to you know come to you but it um but if you don't write them down you lose them immediately, immediately does that happen to you immediately it happens to me and at night i really need like a notepad because it's mm -hmm. not great to start typing in your phone but sometimes i do that too because i have a lot of thoughts at night yeah you think it's like the greatest idea in the world and then it's gone because you just like, and you're like, oh, because happened? you didn't write it down. You didn't oh, write no, down. you definitely yeah. need to keep a notepad. Yeah. It's yeah. when you least expect it. Those yeah. who are, are watching tonight, the you know, yeah. you, you might know what we're talking about. It comes to you in yeah. unexpected moments, especially when you're trying to trying solve to a puzzle. My watch, by the way, I'm looking at my watch because it keeps saying that I'm exercising, but I'm like, but I'm like, this is not exercise. So, so this has um, been fun. It's great. I, I know. Um, so, can you tell us what yeah. you're working on next, Greer? Mm. Um, so, I know your book just came out. I know. No <laughs> pressure. Jeez, you sound like my family. My family is like, chop, chop. When's the next book coming? Um, well, I mean, I have another book. You know, Sarah and I are under contract for another book, but we're actually both also working on individual projects, which. I can't really talk about, but I'm very, um, I'm very excited about it. And, oh, I know I have to do a shameless plug. I've also started a newsletter, so, which you can find, go to my website, greerhendricks.com, where I'm giving, it's called Sincerely Greer Reads, Writes, and Recs. And I'm giving recommendations like podcasts or wild card, you know, things or books and TV shows. Cause I think like one, one thing I missed from corporate publishing was that like seeing people in that water cooler talk of like, you know, mm. what are you listening to? What are you doing this? So um, um, that I'm hoping people will actually write back to me and tell me like what they're, you know, interested mm -hmm. in. I think some of that was like the pandemic too. Like we were so much more isolated and then you left me. Like we used to be just a few yes. blocks away. So. Walk our dogs together oh, and, yeah. and, and discuss our, you know, discuss. what we're up to, no, everything, kids husbands yeah that's that's um, a it's the power of female friendship i think so i mean that's um we were um andre and i were at an event last night and it was most it was international women's day and it was mostly filled with women and they were just there's something about like women lifting up women and mm. you know both of us started these careers you know we're not you know, we're not, we're, we're not spring chickens. Yeah, we're not. We're oh, not. So, <laughs> and just to have that kind of courage. So again, like for anyone, you know, out there, like mm. pursue, pursue your dream and make it happen. Um, you know, you really can, it might take a long time. Um, you know, people think I was like, they're like, oh, you were an overnight success. Well, I was a publisher. I was an editor for 20 years yeah. like yeah. that. I was learning by every, you know, every author that I worked with, I learned from, I learned from every, you know, each and every one of them, something. So right. Yeah. A friend told me the other night, um, well, we were also having an event because my book came out last week. Yeah. And because, as you said, like I, I started later. She said about me that I'm a reader who became a writer. Yeah. And I and I really like that. And that's exactly yeah. what it yeah. happened because I didn't take creative writing. Anyway, again, for people who are wondering or would like to pursue something outside of what they're regular job is or what they're doing at home um you know go for it yeah I, mean, I love reading yeah. and I think that's yeah. how I learned so you were learning from your authors and I guess I was yeah. learning from the authors yeah. I love and read, yeah and read yeah I mean obviously I was a big reader too but I also learned a lot from like kind of what you know not yeah, to do not like, to yeah, do right editing, yeah you know, just which is stuff. why I maybe it took me so many years that's the other thing it was kind of like being in an MFA whatever yeah. for like years and I was learning how what not to do when I would have a reader come back with mm. their feedback. Mm. But it's intimidating also when you read a 
you know, so many of the people we read, you know, so many books out there. I mean, you're, it's, it's intimidating because they're done, but people don't know how many drafts it took mm-hmm. for any author to mm-hmm. get to where they're going. It makes it, it comes out, you guys read it and it seems perfect, but oh my God. It, yeah. It, they, they're awful. I mean, some of them, I mean, mine were awful. Some of the drafts were really bad. Well, one of the things that you, you I wanted to, to mention is that, yes, I did have to throw away a lot, yeah. but it, it all was like backstory, say for like Paloma or yeah. even some of the characters that are still in the book. They're minor characters and I had to really trim down what they were doing, what, you know, their place in the book. But those stories have all now stayed with me and are maybe going to be used in my next oh. writing project. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't consider any of that a waste. Yes. You know, yes. it all serves a purpose. Absolutely. Even if it's not for the one that you're currently working yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, our, my third book with Sarah, we threw out 200, we started writing a book. It was set in a very isolated kind of resort, um, mm. retreat, more like a retreat. And it just wasn't working. And we, we got to like page 200 and every day, and we don't have writer's block. We don't allow ourselves to have writer's block. And every day we're like, what's the next best scene we want to write? And we couldn't think of it. And so we finally realized it was, too, we had like boxed ourselves into such an isolated setting. We had nowhere to go. And we threw out those pages. We moved that book to New York and it just opened up the whole story. Mm-hmm. But the germ of that idea became, um, we did an audible short story and we ended up using kind of an isolated retreat setting and it worked perfectly for a little short story. We just couldn't build a book around it. Loved it. Listened to it with my family on a car trip <laughs> um, and, and everybody loved it. So I highly huh? recommend it. Remind me the title. Um, oh my God. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Because we've called it so many things. Oh my God, this the get the getaway. I think it was the getaway. Oh my so God. Good. <gasps> so good. If that's you ha- alarming. If you have a, you have a road trip it. coming up, that's Thank the you. one to download. Well, it's short. I'm not yeah. sure. It's, I wouldn't say it's our best, but it's short. It's, it's fun. fun. It's, it's fun. So fun. It's fun. It was fun. So, um, should we open up for questions? What's I don't even know. My watch just keeps telling me I'm exercising, but I don't even know what time it is. And I've or tossed I, my cell phone far away, so I don't know what time it is either. Oh, well, maybe we just keep talking. Okay. No, so, okay. Okay. So we do have a few audience right. questions. Okay. Right. Great. Okay. First, what is your writing process like? Um, is, is this for me or for both of us? For both of you. Okay. What's the right? Well. I mean, for, I mean, for me with, with Sarah, we get up at nine and then, well, we get up earlier, but we get, we start talking at nine and we always have to talk about what's going on in our lives for a little while, because that really informs the, our writing day. Like if one of us is struggling with, you know, a kid or a parent or, you know, boyfriend, husband, whatever it is. So we kind of jibber jabber, get that out. And then we would talk about the scene that we, um, what this is like if we're in the middle of a project, we talk about the scene that we're going to write on, uh, write about, and then we would hunker down to work and we would work for from nine to three on Google. Mm-hmm. I'll just talk about the first three books, really nine to three, mm-hmm. Google Docs, Google Hangouts, no camera because it's very distracting to look at yourself all day long. And then, and we would try to write a scene and then think about the next scene that we're going to write for the, our scenes are short. We try to think about the scene that we're going to tackle the next day. That would be like a good rhythm for us when we were like kind of in a flow. What about you? Well, I, I start my day a little later <laughs> than <laughs> and Sarah. Um, and I like to walk my dog and maybe that's yeah. my way. Like I yeah. start the day like that and I'll listen maybe to a, a audible book or just music. And then once um, I sometimes have to trick myself into getting to my desk. So I won't have my first, I, I drink mate, which is Argentine tea. Um, and I love that. Um, but I won't start it drinking it until I'm at my desk, you know, oh, so, so it's like good. holding off on, on doing that. And then what I like to do, and it's something that I, I, I'm pretty sure Ernest Hemingway was like, you know, have those quotes. It's like, don't leave your, your typewriter or your notebook when you know what you're going to write the next day don't yeah, yeah. Do, something along those lines and that really works for me yeah so that i know i can have something to come back to the yeah. next day yeah that's a little bit like us talking about the scene that we want to tackle oh, because we, yes. yeah because we have that then it's like percolating overnight right and you make those connections yes yeah. and then at least you know you, you have something you can write instead yeah. of re- coming to your desk and just sort of staring at this you know the mm-hmm. screen or, or the mm-hmm. notepad um, I don't work as long as you do. 
I can't work for more than two hours. Yeah. And again, like like I told you, I like to cook. I even mm -hmm. like to do laundry. I don't know. It's we I'm a weird that way. But it I, those are like forty minute increments yeah. in some way, like putting in a load. Yeah. And so I know I only have to be at my desk for forty minutes because then I have to go and do something. Yeah. So well, that's I, another way of disciplining myself. It's different when you have, when you're collaborating with somebody because it's more just like tonight, like flies by. I just think there's mm -hmm. just more, mm -hmm. I think if, when, you know, like writing when you're solo, it just, I, I would imagine it's just different. It's just different. So. But definitely the morning is for me the most productive yeah. time of the yeah. day. But then like we were talking about how when you're walking and or you're doing something completely different from the writing and an idea will pop into your mind. I'll run over and write it down maybe yeah. on my computer and then maybe I'll sit down again for another hour. So yeah. that's that's an exciting time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, when you're like, the ideas are flowing. Yeah. All right. What kind of research do you do before writing and how long do you usually do research for? I mean, my books don't really have a ton of research. So I would say there's a lot of um, brainstorming that goes into um, an idea before Sarah and I would sit down to to write I and mean, we would talk endlessly about the characters and the setting and different kind of different plot twists. Um, the research sort of came about would often come about during the writing like for example like in anonymous girl one of my favorite parts was um we in, we sprinkle some psychological studies throughout the book mm -hmm. and i loved doing the research for that and then for you are not alone each um chapter for our main uh character shay there's a data nugget because for a long time she didn't have a name her name is data girl mm -hmm. <laughs> and because she sees the world through data and so that was also really fun to find data that informed each chapter um so but that's just like little bits like you had a lot more research to do i did um but it, i also i was doing it also at the same time as i was writing mm -hmm. um research well just from my having being my having lived in buenos aires in the 1990s i sort of knew already a lot but it was yeah going back to the 1970s that required more research and I wouldn't let that hinder if I was writing, then I would then I would go back to make fact check and make sure that I had mm -hmm. my dates right or, you know, I don't know. So it was a little bit back and forth. Now in my second book, I'm spending yeah. probably too much time doing research and <laughs> not, not wanting to sit down. I mean, I, I, I you know, I yeah. hear that about yeah, people yeah, who write, yeah. you know, they, they just get so caught up in the research. They don't know when enough is enough yeah. and when they actually have to sit down. I'm having a little bit of that right now. Um, one of my favorite, she's a friend, but also someone I edited and is a brilliant writer, Gretchen Rubin, mm. um, who mm -hmm. writes, you know, she wrote The Happiness Project, yes. and, but she says research is me search. And I think that that's true, right? You can really, and you can really spend endless amounts mm -hmm. of time. I mean, and she also says, and I think this is true too, that you can spend that like, work can be the greatest procrastination of all right mm -hmm. <laughs> so, i like so, that one yeah right so <laughs> we all know that <laughs> okay do you write your characters with specific people in mind um no um none of my characters are specific people i did think there was an actress for one one um one of my books who i pictured the entire time mm -hmm. and but that's the only character ever like normally <clears throat> after i think about it like now i look back at the wife between us and i was like i would love margot roby to be the star mm -hmm. of that or i would love this person but the whole time i was picturing an, an anonymous girl there was a character i pictured looking like a, a young nicole kidman so but i'm not giving away which character it is mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what about you no um no i mean i have some real figures because of the historical fiction like of the president of Argentina and yeah. some like one character who I base on somebody who was in the armed forces but you know because it's fiction I you know was able to do whatever I wanted so I would say a couple of characters were maybe inspired by some of the people I met but now they're all fictional okay how long on average does it take you to write a book <laughs> well, <laughs> in my case, I only have one. I, I, <laughs> on the average one. Years, <laughs> years, years. <laughs> oh, I mean, for Sarah and I, it was, I would say it's, a, it was a, about, a, a, it's about a year for each book. I mean, give or take, uh, more like I mean, a little over a year, I'd say. This year, there was two years in between our books because um, we were so delayed on the third book. It sort of 
slowed everything down for the fourth. And then we really wanted with COVID and everything, we wanted a lot of time to set this book up. So this book actually, we finished writing it a year ago and they've just been, but my, mm. so my publisher has just been spending all this time doing incredible promotion for it. So, mm. um, but it's fun. Like some of, I like the buildup. I, I love the whole publishing process. And I don't know if that's because, you know, I was an editor. So I like find it endlessly fascinating. Like when every part of it, like when they send me, you know, a cover, when they tell me about the marketing mm -hmm. or all of that, because I just, it's like my business brain is, you know, is on with all that as well. So it doesn't get old with your fourth? No, it's always. No, exciting. it's always, like when I opened the box of books and I still like, it was more beautiful than I had yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Now it's our turn. Yeah. Yes. It's more beautiful than I had even imagined. And it's like just so elegant. And it looks mm. different than all my other books, but, mm. um, and yours too. But you only have the air seat. You only brought your, you only have your advanced I'm readers sorry. copy, but that's okay. This is still what the cover looks like, but like mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I love the cover. Show and, and tell. Show and tell. Yeah. And okay. I was able to be involved in, you know, yeah. suggesting initially oh, that's what, fun. what they first said, send us. Um, artwork oh. or anything that you know you think would help our creative director i thought that was a great exercise yeah and also when you should talk about your title because unlike we oh. had our title all along you know from our editor mm -hmm. but yours you had very you oh. went through a lot of titles. okay well because one the one what? that you read it was what? southern cross and you're like andrea oh god that was awful then there was, was, was the, ambassador's the ambassador's daughter, daughter. and then yeah. unlike the golden couple there's several books out there called the ambassador's daughter uh-huh and then so when you read the book yeah. you'll see there's several i mean first it's called on a night of a thousand stars mm -hmm. and there's in Argentina, there's these huge skies, big yeah. skies, and you can see the stars in a way that you can't. In, it's it's you know. a per, it's a perfect yeah. title. It's so much, I liked the Ambassador's Daughter. I remember when you so gave it I. up. But it, this is actually a better title. Oh, welcome. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. So glad to hear that. Yeah, I think my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrea, you kind of already answered my follow up question, but Greer, how involved are you with like getting the cover art of your book and kind of deciding what's on there? Yeah. Um, well, so for the wife between us, um, I mean, I had no idea how they were going to design that cover. And literally one day our editor called and she's like, I have a cover for you. And she sent us one cover. Can I, I yeah, I'm just yeah, doing yeah. show and tell yeah. I, because it is, I mean, it's the perfect cover for this book. And they, it looked exactly like this. We didn't make a change. I mean, it was perfect I burst into tears I was so happy <laughs> and then because this book did really well they kept kind of this is fun having show and tell mm -hmm. care of people they did like that kind of looked the same similar and then they moved on and the, whatever anyway the third book kind of looked similar but but it kind of got it got a little diluted then um oh god I'm glad I'm not in like my pajama pants or sweatpants <laughs> what if I sit up like for so used to <laughs> um so um but and then for this book we wanted like a different kind of a different a different look but i nobody's ever really i mean asked us like to send things and i think for you because like argentina and the you know it, it made more sense mm -hmm. to send to give them kind of like more of a feel a feel for it yes um but it took us a lot of uh incarnations to get this the first few covers were really different um, and none of them really worked like they were four they sent me sent us like four or eight or something and I I, I was just like god I kind of like this element of this mm -hmm. and this of this but once you start doing that it becomes like Frankenstein I think and that's a little bit what was happening it just wasn't working and then our and then our editor Jam was like you know what? don't don't even worry about it I've got we've got something else and it's great and then they sent us that and it was just beautiful mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, so for a final question, it's one of our favorites here at RJ Julia. What are you both reading right now? Oh, good. I would, that's funny. I was because I was going to actually ask you that. Um, so, should I go? Yeah. Okay. No, um, are you, I, okay. Yeah. Well, well. I mean, I just finished on a night of a thousand stars, so of course. <laughs> but that, um, but I tend to try to like when I'm working on something new, I really try to stay out of my genre because mm -hmm. it's way too intimidating. So the last two books I read were actually both um, nonfiction. I read Crying in H Mart. I know I'm slow to the slow to the to the table on that beautiful memoir, and then um, an Invisible Child, which is all um, about a young well, a family in who's really 
Growing Up in Poverty in New York City. It is not an uplifting book. It's narrative, narrative nonfiction. The reporter did such an incredible job with access to this family. And um, it was heartbreaking and just had such insight. And, you know, as a New Yorker, I just felt like I saw a whole different world. What Dasani I, was Dasani, the girl. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember reading the series in the New York Times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But the book, I thought maybe I would have felt like I already knew the story, but it's oh, it's incredible. Oh, okay, I'm going to write yeah. that down. Yeah, yeah. I want to read it. So I just finished The Golden Couple <laughs> and loved it. Hi, please buy it now. I don't know how you guys are going to organize that if you yeah. can click on something. Yeah. But, Run, don't walk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I read several books at the same time, but I did start just also a couple of days ago, another friend of mine, John Avalon, who is on CNN. He's a political analyst. He finished his, uh, the book called Lincoln, The Fight for Peace. Okay. And you think, okay, what else can you write about Abraham Lincoln? Yeah. But is he covers the last few weeks of his life. And I just finished introduction, what? it's so compelling. John writes as, I mean, it's nonfiction, but he writes in a way that just, makes you want to page the turn and yeah. um, turn the page yeah. and and continue reading um so i'm really enjoying that one wait it's so funny i feel like we're both reading these really serious like non-fiction books which yeah. is you know i'll tell you what's next up on my list though okay. to read is um john searle speaking of john has a new book out um that i'm really eager i don't know if he's doing an event with you guys but he's so he's so great and he hasn't written a new book in like eight years and he's just the funniest great 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 guy so it's called the last affair or her last affair oh, okay so that's next up for me okay something fun mm -hmm. very nice okay well thank you both to greer and andrea it's been such a lovely hour with you as always do not forget to purchase a copy of the golden couple and on a night of a thousand stars there are links in your chat box you can easily click on those to purchase it or again, you can come visit us in store. Thank you both again, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their night. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. So fun. Bye.